Does today's data and application explosion stop or accelerate your success? Driven by multi-cloud, 5G, connected devices and edge computing, this richness of data opens up infinite new opportunities. But all this may also add complexity and risks that throw you off track to insight and innovation. We serve as the digital heartbeat of Nordic society. We help you to hyper-connect all your systems to a secure, stable and scalable platform that adds value for you and your customers. And by hyper-connecting data, applications and talent, you open your silos and ignite a free flow of ideas and innovation. So, while others struggle with exploding difficulties, you accelerate to success. Hyper-connected data, applications and talent. Remove obstacles, accelerate to success. The route to insights and innovation. Tieto Every. A warm welcome, everyone. This live stream is designed to inspire you and give you thought for action. I'll be your moderator, prepared with lots of questions, a sharp eye on the clock and on our guests. Luckily, I'm assisted here in the studio by Johan Torstensson. Hi, Johan. Hi, Beata. You're head of cloud and infra at uh, Tieto Afri. Yeah. What do your customers need more help with today compared with two years ago, would you say? Well, if we talk two years ago, the customers came and said, help me with the cloud strategy. You know, what I'm going to do with this cloud thing. Today, it's much more business oriented. They say, I have a business opportunity. Can you help me with technology to make that happen? So it's, it's much more fun right now because now it's about real business opportunities. Um, what we call this event the route to insights and innovation. Mm -hmm. Briefly explain, what do you mean with route? Well, root can have two meanings in this perspective. Both how we in Tieta Every can help our customers to actually get insight from data and create innovation. But it's also the route, like the road. If you look at the city, if you don't have the roads right and the infrastructure of the city, it's chaos in those cities if you've been traveling around the world. And this is what we're seeing too. We in Tieta Every helping our customers with having that infrastructure in place so they can create insight and innovation. What are the most important steps on this route, would you say? Could you help us summarize? Well, yeah. So first, it's all about data. And it's about connecting data instead of siloed. So that's number one. So don't silo data between different areas. Connect it. Number two is create a platform which is stable, which is scalable, and most important also, which is built in security so that you can actually innovate on that one. And number three, it's not only about technology, it's actually about people. So create teams of people with business expertise and technology expertise, so they can, in, the, in those co-creation, these, these insights and innovations. And I know that last part, yeah. having the right people, the right mix yeah. of people, yeah. insights from both technology and business yeah. is a favorite subject of yours and one that we will uh, be talking a lot about today. Mm -hmm. And in what way has the, this route to insights um, and innovation become increasingly complex, would you say? What's the reason? Yeah. So if I had three things before, <laughs> now I'm going to four. Now I'm making it more complicated. So first is this fantastic data explosion. Data is not coming anymore only from your, your back office systems, your ERP, CRM system. It's coming from all these connected devices and all this unstructured data. So that, again makes it more complicated. Unstructured, but still valuable. Oh, so valuable if you do it right. Number two is, where do you have the data? In the past, you had it in your data center, more or less. Now you might have data in the public cloud for certain types of data. You might have it in a new private hybrid cloud solution. And you have it also in your legacy environment. You might be running a mainframe, which is very valuable, but you have your data all over. And that makes it, instead of having, call it a a multi-cloud situation, you get multi-silos. And then, 
which is also, again, it's a, it makes it complicated, but it's more people in the company now who wants the data. It's not only these super users. Everyone in the company wants to have access to the data. So how do you handle that to give that access and get the right person access to the right data? Completely new demands. It's completely new demands. And then you have the external factors, call it uh, regulations and also cybersecurity threats, which is like an, an arrow in the other directions, which sometimes hinders companies and organizations to, to move fast. You don't know what are the rules now of the game, what did the EU say last week, and what are the hackers after us this time? You know, so that's, those four things are, are making it more complex. And today we'll be talking about how to handle these complexities and a lot about new ways of working. And in, you'll hear examples of that. You'll meet um, four thought leaders carefully selected to give you examples of ways of working and real forward thinking uh, insights uh, that we hope will be practical and straightforward. So our first source of inspiration is Stora Enso. Um, why is this such a, a good example of uh, how to foster and scale innovation, Yuan? Well, here you have what we can call a traditional company or a very experienced company, you can say, who has actually understood the possibility of technology and totally changing the market they're going after. I'm, I mean, the first time I met them, I got so inspired. I didn't understand all these things you can do with trees. Yeah. So, um, with a company history of over 800 years, Storanzo is continuously innovating um, to adapt both to new um, customer demands and market conditions, helping not just um, uh, helping not only revenue st streams stay healthy, but also the environment. And it's so amazing what you can do with a tree. Take a look. Have you ever thought about what trees will be able to do in the future? Transparent wood, programmable wood that can change shape or form depending on the needs, paper that can store energy, and solar panels from trees. Have you ever thought about what a tree can do? We do, all the time. Stora Enso, the renewable materials company. Please help me in welcoming a person uh, who is responsible for group strategy, execution of all IT services, and the strategy for group digitalization at Stora Enso. Timo Salmi is joining us. Hi, Timo. Um, I'll just check. Can we get the sound on, please, for me in the studio? Okay, let's see. Let's try it better now. Good morning to both of you. How are you doing? We're so great, and we're so happy that you're joining us. You know, you are Yuan's favorite C CIO, and you were <laughs> awarded. Oh. <laughs> you were Good start of the day. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you were awarded CIO of the year in Finland in 2020. Can you tell us briefly how you've innovated the role of the CIO? Wow, it's a big question. Innovated the role, I don't know if I've done that. Let me start first of all by saying I'm extremely proud and happy about uh, that announcement, of course, and it, it goes to the full team. It's not only one person. I have a great team working with me, right? But I, I think that a couple of things that I really have focused in my role since I took over a bit more than four years ago as a CIO for, for Storanzo is to, to focus on, on, on digital innovation, right? I mean, it's, it's so important that we drive that agenda. Uh, it's a company agenda. It's not you know, it's not a technology agenda, it's a company agenda, but my, me and my organization are custodians of that. Second thing is probably focusing, you know, changing the focus from cost to value in all IT discussions, because there's, it's so easy to get trapped in the cost discussion without understanding what value you bring, right? And then, of course, last but not absolutely not least, service delivery and quality in everyday operations. I think that those would be the focus areas that I've been working on for next year. You're like the translator of opportunities, the translator of value to the rest of the organization. Well, I would say maybe an inspiration, maybe an idea partner, maybe someone who comes with the ideas. I think strongly that the business itself, they have all the ideas. I mean, they know how they want to develop their business. 
with, with the help of technology, we can do a little bit more. We can think in new ways. We can generate new revenue streams with different solutions that we haven't thought about before. And we have. We have launched new uh, uh, business services based on, on, on platform economy, for instance. We'll talk more about the role of the CIO uh, a bit later. Packaging and paper has been your business for hundreds of years. But very briefly, what has happened to that market in the last two years? Wow, a lot, right? Uh, I mean, if I just take a bit of perspective on two years that you asked me about, and, and let's let's look at 15 years, because that's in our history still a very short time, I would say. And 15 years ago for our company, the paper business uh, was 70% of our revenue. And, and we anticipated this year to be less than 20% of our revenue. So paper has been in an industrial decline for years, and it has accelerated actually uh, due to the pandemic as well. But of course, I mean, in those situations, you're forced to innovate. I mean, you really have to put your focus on innovation. And we've done so as a company and innovated new solutions and products to cater for the drop in business in paper. So let's talk about your innovation agenda. Where do we where do you suggest we start? Well, I mean, I think the film itself that you started with is a great example, right? I mean, it's not many companies who has a great opportunity that the raw material we're using are not, it's not only recyclable, it's renewable, right? It regrows year after year after year. Obviously, you have to have a sustainable forestry in mind in order to make that happen, right? But for, for every tree that we harvest, we plant two new, at least. That's how we make sure that we have sustainable forestry at hand. And then we have continued to innovate, you know, uh, based on that. And I'm not a chemist, so I'm not going to go deep into this. But if you look at the tree, it uh, basically contains three things, cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. And we've been able to find ways to separate those uh, uh, components from each other and then rebuild it into new use cases. And the lignin, that's basically the glue that makes the tree, tree stand up and, and keep together that material is a source of many good things to come. Like for instance, you know, uh, batteries, energy storage solutions, you saw the solar panels, carbon fiber like products made out of lignin. So we are really developing solutions for, for uh, uh, you know, fossil based replacement solutions. Yeah, and how do you encourage participation and, and also collaboration in the innovation process from all employees, because I know that you're trying to foster a mindset where everyone's participating, basically. That's a good question. We started some five, six years ago thinking about how can we ensure that we can tap the brain of all the 24,000 people we have in the company. And we, we started with an open innovation process we call the DigiFund. So basically, we set aside 10 million euro, and we've done that every year since uh, five years ago, starting five years ago, where we say that anyone in the company who has a great idea of something that we, a problem that we need to solve or a business opportunity that we need to try out is welcome to apply through the fund to get some uh, uh, resources to try out, test that idea. Tell us how it works in practice. How, how do you steer the process? How do you prioritize? How do you set time aside for teams to work? Um, tell us more. Well, first of all, it, it's an inclusive process, right? I mean, really encourage people in the company to apply and, and to be part of the process itself. Then we have a couple of criteria that we look at before selecting. It has to be involve new technology that we haven't tried before. It has to have a specific business challenge that we are addressing, either, either a new revenue opportunity or a technical problem that we need to solve, right? And, 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 and then we, and we set aside resources from, from a small center of excellence that I have uh, uh, established, and we also steer the process. And then we find ecosystems and partners on the outside to help us actually test and validate that idea. So we push it from a you know, uh, idea to concept, to proof of concept, and to pilot in months instead of years, as we used to do as a traditional company, like you one was saying in the beginning. And the people in the business, they continue collaborating uh, together and having the support from you in, the, in, in this yeah. innovation process. Mm? Yeah, it's a very good point that you bring up, Beata, there, because, I mean, the innovation idea is owned by the business. I, I want to emphasize that, that the team that I have, we are there to help, support, enable, uh, drive 
but the, the idea comes from the business and, and we, they have to stay accountable for testing and proving that idea. It's a business driven innovation agenda we have. That is so important to keep in mind. And I also hear that you're trying to raise the borders between being inside of the company and um, the, uh, all the players in the ecosystem around um, the, the, startup, um, the startup ecosystem, uh, partners, etc. Um, I think it's a great example of how to hyper-connect, to use a, a, um, a popular phrase. But what creates engagement in all of these interactions and collaborations? Well, I think... If we start with the internal, I mean, we have to make sure that people, uh, that, that they get the opportunity to live throughout their own idea. So we need to give the people the time and possibility to actually drive their idea from start to, 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 to finish, right? And be participating, owning the idea that they have, right? And then externally, I, I think it's, it, it's about finding the right partners, whether it's a startup or any other company that is fit for the, to, the purpose of to say what we have at hand, the development of that opportunity or challenge that we have. And for us, the startup ecosystem has been extremely valuable. And we found many, many good solutions to our opportunities. And we commercialized with over 30 startups still today based coming out of our innovation pipeline. I know you're constantly scanning startups. Can you give us some advice on how to invite uh, or, or how to collaborate? You, I mean, you're a huge company. Uh, collaborating with a very small entity who has been around for maybe a few years. What are the success factors here for finding a fruit for collaboration? Well, I mean, first of all, it, it's to, to, to have some kind of accelerated partner in, on the journey, I would say. And, and five years ago, we, we are one of the founding members of an industry network created by the Wallenberg family called Combian. So, you know, Combian is a company that brings all the Wallenberg companies together. The, idea, the original idea was to share digital innovation agenda between the, the, the companies, right? Now we have expanded a little more than that. But within Combian, we have one business stream we call the Foundry. And the Foundry actually is a startup accelerator that helps all the companies in our network to to find the appropriate uh, startup company based on the idea that we have. So that, that is how we started and, and it has been very fruitful for us. And uh, the second thing, if I may be able to add there as well, is of course that you have to be specific from, an, from a company perspective. We have to be specific on our idea. We have to be specific on our opportunity. That's something that we learned that we have to describe what we need very well before we enter the journey. Yeah. Can Tell us also about the role of your cloud strategy and how that enables um, innovation, if that's an important component. Well, I mean, I think that today it, it's impossible not to have a cloud strategy. Having said that, it's nothing that we emphasize, to be totally frank. When it comes to our infrastructure and our backend, I mean, we have a mix today of a hybrid cloud. We have a private cloud uh, uh, and, and we, we are also using uh, public clouds, right? But then the most important thing also connecting maybe the core IT agenda with the digital innovation agenda is to look at test of breed. So, so when we have process development, when we have something that we need to improve in our company, we look at the best of breed solutions on the market and then we tap them in. And usually these are SaaS players today and, and, and you have to make sure these SaaS players are cloud native to start with. So by that, the, that process is driving our cloud strategy itself. And, and I want to emphasize what you once said in the beginning, beginning, that the data is so important. You know, having your transactional systems in the back end, yes, you need to have that in order. But if you have the data there in order, you can tap in source solutions and, and ensure that the data flows create also value mm -hmm. for our company. And scale so much more rapidly. I'd like yes, to exactly. finish um, by talking a bit about your latest initiative with H&M. Um, tree to textile. So it, it's so innovative. You're creating a complement to cotton. Uh, and can you talk about why that is such an, an important innovation from a sustainability perspective? Because it's so fun and, and, and so forward thinking. Sure, let me do that. <clears throat> let me start by saying that we have four companies uh, uh, in the ecosystem. It's us, H&M, IKEA, and an investment group called LSCS. And, and together, of course, the market is screaming for more sustainable solutions to the textile industry and to the raw material in the textile industry. So the way that the raw material today is produced is not sustainable, it consumes a lot of water, it consumes a lot of land that can be used for food production, for instance, in many poorer countries, right? 
So we have now innovated a process where we, with the, with the um, tree fibers, actually can, can create a replacement or an alternative, a sustainable alternative to the textile raw material industry. And it, of course, starts with a tree. And then, then there's a process for how we, how we will develop that tree into textile raw material uh, for the future. Following, so your, hope- following your innovation process, I guess. Absolutely. Working Absolutely. in the ecosystem with these partners. Absolutely. Such a great example. Uh, Johan and, and Timo, in what way do the two of you support each other? Because Storans is a client of yours. Mm. How, how do you two work together? Well, th- I see two things we, we bring to, to uh, uh, Storans. So one is, I mean, we have industry knowledge. You need to be able to work with a customer like, like Timo and, and Storenzo. You need to understand their business. If you don't do that, you're probably going to pitch the wrong thing or come with the wrong idea. So, so understanding their opportunity, their challenge. And number two is what Timo talked so much about, the underlying platform. To say, you know, this needs to be a stable platform in order for Timo and the team to spend time on innovation and not operational issue. And how to, that platform, how they can connect those SaaS solutions with the traditional, call, call it private cloud solution. So... You know, I talked about this platform. So the platform and industry knowledge, I would say. What do you see as the main value in your relationship? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, us and Peter Every, we go way back when it comes to relationship. We have a long story together. And, and it, it's in kind of in many places. It's in, like you once said, it's in the infrastructure piece, it's in the application piece and, and, and so on, right? And, and I think that Peter Every is... A, you know, from a company perspective, very well positioned to understand what are our challenges, what are our opportunities, and to help us drive our innovation agenda. Right. So we have a long-standing history uh, which we cherish. And as CIO of the year in Finland, can you just give us a bit more advice on what capabilities do you would you like to see more of in your team? What do you think is will be increasingly important going forward? Well. I- I think I can only talk for myself on what has been success factors for us, right? Not knowing if that is for everyone. But I, but I think that having the business-driven innovation mindset is so critical. And I've seen that examples when you're trying to scale up a huge digital organization in a technology part of the organization, that doesn't work. So our approach has been to have a small center of excellence that helps the business to drive their digital innovation agenda. So the business needs to ensure that they also start employing the right capabilities to match with the COE to drive the digital innovation agenda for the company. That has been a success for us. And then of course, the mindset and attitude, nothing is impossible. Don't say no, say yes, right? And try it out, try new things, be, be there and, and be ready to fail, be ready to win. I think attitude and mindset is very important. And we try to learn a lot from the startup world, how to drive innovation and business development in general. And really love, the insights, the customer feedback, and live with sort of the business development, I hear you say. Anything you want to comment? This is one of your favorite subjects, you want? No, but you, think, are a, yeah. a, you are a former CIO from Ericsson, I know. Yes, and, and being a CIO, I think once to make it very simple, I think the CIO should show, show their beautiful side to the business, meaning the face of TMO to the business, so that you don't turn their back. It's many sometimes when you have issues with the back end system, such the SO, CIO turns their, excuse my language, the ugly side to the business and just work with their suppliers to fix the operations. So, doing what Tim is doing, I make sure the underlying is working so he can show his, his beautiful face to the business, mm-hmm. so to say. Thank you so much, Timur, for joining us and um, for, for giving us so much inspiration and practical um, advice as well. Kitos. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, Thank you. Timur. Bye. Thank you. So, you want, how come some organizations uh, manage to develop mm. new ways of working, even though you're 800 years old, mm. while others are st- stuck in sort of old norms, mm. old systems? Yeah. So it's almost like I'm actually now going to repeat a little bit what Tim was talking about. But if you see first, I think one of the issues a lot of organizations have when it comes to the CIO and the role of CIOs or CDOs is, is you know, where do you place this? And what, what is the role of the CIO in the company? You heard Tim talking about actually being that you know, facilitator. Uh, so that is one. You know, if you place and hide the CIO somewhere under the CFO and doesn't get the the attention in, in leadership meetings and such, 
then it, then it don't get the value, and it will not happen. Number two is, it's a lot of people just looking at IT as a cost because that was the back end systems, and you heard Tim was saying that too. You know, I talk about investments. See, IT as investment. He talked about bringing value, mm, improving that value, proving value. So actually, that the the CIO organization, the IT, the technology organization becomes somebody who delivers values and seen as an investment. And finally, even though it's a technology question, is to adapt to understanding when you now move into this using this new technology, we're talking about cloud, that this is not only a technology question, this is actually changing your way you're working. And you had some great examples for Tim, how he changed his organization's way of working to become that true business partner and start adding value. And you can also hear him say that we're constantly innovating yeah our way of working. So yeah. when he was describing the case of working with startups, yeah. we need to be very specific. Our mm -hmm. team can't be too big. No. We need to help them exactly. work with us, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so understanding that is, is a capability. Uh, yeah. And daring to try new things and saying, be open. He said, say yes. So this is the point. I mean, you've been working, a lot of things have been working, but daring to change. Is, is, I think, one of the tricks for not only the CIOs, but for the whole business. Because remember what Timo said, this is not the CIO questions, this is the business question. Yeah. And I think that is one of the key takeaways, of course. Um, who will we meet now? We'll have a new guest on the show. Yes, so our next guest is a person who's actually been working in the IT industry, knowing the technology possibility, has been an expert in the health and public sector, who now moved over becoming a CEO of a health company. And I think this, this is one of the beauties today, that if you work in the technology business I do, that actually your skills from the IT industry are needed in top positions of companies. So time for our next guest. Time for me to welcome um, CEO of Sodexo, Senior Healthcare and Education Nor uh, Nordics, Christina Petros uh, Petrescu. Hi, Christina. Hi, hello. Nice to be here. And uh, thanks, Beata. It's really nice to be invited back, I would say. Yes, because in a way you are back. You were head of uh, public sector at Tieto before you joined Sodexo. Tell us more, what kind of uh, important IT savviness did you bring to Sodexo? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say for me, it's, uh, it's more about, you know, the business and the business benefit as such and, and how tech can contribute to, to develop services for the customers. Um, what I will also like to, to say, and what I hope that uh, I have um, taken with me, and uh, it is in my experience actually, which I will also like to increase in, in Sodexo, it's the awareness in the organization when it comes to uh, be able to uh, develop new services for the clients with the help from tech. And create that kind of perhaps demand that we can do more with technology um, and your, your team can, can support. What's special with your business if we look at how and where your services are delivered? Yeah, what I would like to say is that uh, we're a company that are very keen on, on the individuals, actually. And uh, we are a value-driven company and we like uh, the purpose, the purpose uh, with our services, actually. So we contribute to increase the individual's quality of life, which may sound a little bit, you know, uh, very big, but this is actually what we are doing with, the, with our services. And we contribute to the individual's independence and actually active participation in the community and also inclusion in the community. But you we meet, meet, you meet, yeah, we meet the customers at home in many cases. Mm -hmm. And these are people that you're helping to raise their quality of life. Um, in an industry that, if I may say so, has not traditionally been so at the forefront of technology, 
Um, I know that you at Sodexo, you've accelerated your digitalization process in the last two years. Can you, can you give us some insights on what parts of the business benefit the most from digitalization? One of our uh, parts uh, in the business, the business portfolio is aid equipment. And this is about a lot about mobility and also, again, uh, helping uh, people into uh, functioning much better in the society. And we provide in this area, we provide services that are customized and also uh, standard equipment. Like if we think in terms of wheelchairs, uh, beds for the hospitals at home, uh, different type of lifts. And our industry is very much based and dependent on human capital. This is very important to understand. But uh, when it comes to the technology and digitalization, uh, this provides also uh, the opportunity of higher quality, increasing the quality of our services, increasing accessibility, but also decreasing risks, uh, risk caused by you know, human errors or um, actually looking into health problems, how we can avoid this. And this is very important, both for the health givers, but also for the end users, for the patient. Tell us more uh, about the focus um, of your digitalization process here and, and, and what areas you are working with to improve quality of life. Um, I mean, for us, it's very important to improve uh, the business processes um, and also increase the customer experience because we know that uh, the customers are in, in front. It's the most important for us, actually. And the customers in this, this case, many times it's us as individuals, as citizens, actually. And um, how can our services contribute in order to decrease the administration? And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, release time and then the give more time actually to the caregivers in order to take care of the patients and simplify their daily work. And uh, also, uh, how can we bring more innovation? Because this is really important in order to, uh, to improve the services. And how do we increase the, and um, how we do um, have a better collaboration with uh, with startups, with partners, uh, and uh, with suppliers. Get, just to, for us to get a better understanding of what are the opportunities of innovation, tell us some areas where we can expect some really interesting things from Sodexo going forward. Um, yeah, you mean uh, what could be when, when it uh, when it comes to um, uh, areas where uh, where we can improve a lot more? I think um, it's of course in uh, in food and cleaning, for instance. Uh, I see that um, we as consumers actually we change our behaviors and the preferences, and this is going to be very important in the future. It is already very important. So that's why uh, th this is really um, uh, looking into that. How do we take this into consideration? And this is a big driver, a very important, a main driver for us in, in Sodexo, actually. And together with sustainability and health aspects, of course. And this is where we see that we actually can use data and uh, AI. And uh, we, I hope that we will see more of that in the future in order to, for instance, to personalize the nutrition, food, but also uh, sourcing and traceability. Mm. And I can also give some examples. So, you, you know, that uh, the microservices, for instance, that we are using is self, it's helping us a lot in compliance and predictability. So data to personalize nutrition, data to personalize care, um, and to give a personalized ex customer experience, care experience. And also, I guess you talked a lot about the equipment that you're using. I mean, these are these connected devices today? The wheelchairs, the beds, are they connected? Yes, they are, they are not really connected today, but 
Of course, this is what we are aiming in the future. I think you are also talking about the connection and also, um, uh, Miko, I, I think the technology systems for, you know, more monitoring the uh, resources, equipment, uh, you know, improving the workflows. Uh, this is the type of connectivity and this is the type of services that, that we see developing more and more in the future, definitely for our clients. And as I said, this is very important both for our clients, but also for the whole society, because at the end, we have the end customer. And in the end, we'll all be um, customers <laughs> in some way. Um, exactly. Were there any benefits, would you say, of not being the earliest adopters of technology, but starting, you know, fairly recently? Yeah, depends how you see it, but, but of course, I think, if, first of all, is that we haven't rushed into, okay, we will take the first available solution or the best, maybe, if we, if we, we are happy, the best solution uh, available. But in dialogue uh, with, uh, with our clients and with partners, also based on the experience and competence that we have in the company, we have been able to develop services more spot on so that's maybe yeah i would say something that it's it's good to mention here and we have been also able to package the solution in the best possible way for the benefit of the clients mm. Johan, mm. um you hear christina describe oppor innovation opportunities yeah. Um, what are the opportunities with connected devices like the connected wheelchair or the yeah. connected bed, the connected floor um, that could help, for example, for security well, or cleaning? Or yeah, I mean, there, there are so many opportunities, both in Christina, the industry Christina works in, but in many industries. And you heard Christina talk about, just to give some repetition, take the access card. It's a simple thing. But in the past, you know, we had, call it manual, we had keys and how to make sure that you give the right access to the right individual. We're talking about to homes or people or to companies. That is just one example where, where you actually work with risk mitigation or minimizing risk for the companies. Then you have, call it the connected wheelchair. First, you know, the first simple way, because some people say, oh, how far can we go? But make it the first simple way, RFID, you know, you know where they are. That's a good start. You might not have to have as, so many wheelchairs if you know where they are. So you have that. And then, of course, you can see with the data what they're being used for, you know, if they get, need maintenance and so on in the future. But start easy with that one. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk about you and me, you know, when we get help, uh, you know, we go to the hospital still. At least I do. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel old. But I'm starting to try some of the new services. But if you can you know, have equipment at home, which you can take your own blood pressure, you know, the oxygen in your blood, uh, you know, now with COVID, and suddenly you can connect that and the doctor can see it remote. You don't have to move. So then, you know, there's so many opportunities. How far away are you, Christina, to work in a more connect, hyper-connected way with both people, patients, and uh, physical objects being connected? I would like to say that we are that far away, and of course, uh, definitely we could also say that the uh, COVID uh, accelerates uh, a bit more the process because I think that uh, contributed a lot to increasing the awareness, both uh, in our own organization, but also uh, with our clients that we see that. So we are not that far away, but of course, it's like, you know, uh, and technology is the enabler actually what we have to do here is just to look sit together again uh, based on our experience and competence and also with the needs from from the clients look into uh, the services that we have and develop them even more for the future because i think that uh, there's a no brainer that this is what we have to do so we are not that far away but still a little bit to go. I can take an example, uh, actually cleaning area, where I see that we can actually bring uh, cleaning to next level. And this is uh, related to the different type of so the technology, using of data, but also how we can improve the, the patient safety and the client safety. Because in our assignments, uh, we have uh, 
very important is to secure the safety, actually. Uh, it's one of our important tasks. And this is examples like, you know, uh, technology and systems for monitoring resources, equipment and uh, workflows. And one can see going back, um, re-engineering back that new materials mm. that clean clean themselves, uh, the use of smart mm. smart technology here mm. is an area where you will need to find partners going forward and that ecosystem of partners will become increasingly important. Thank you so much. Um, this is such an interesting area because yeah. we're all kind of users are connected. We have somebody uh, in care in our family. So thank you for giving us insights into this area, Christina. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So, how how could you um, mm. at Tier to Every um, support the development within uh, mm. smart services? Say cleaning, which yeah. for me is kind of a complex yeah. area. How would you do that? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the industry Christina comes from, you know. It's about people. It's a lot about people and knowledge. So what we can do is be part of her team. She talked about her ecosystem. We want to be part of her team and co-create with her. And if you look at that, there was a CIO once told me, which was one of my customers says, you know, innovation is not only about thinking about outside of the black box. It's actually take that other black box with another customer and bring it to me. Mm. So what we can bring is knowledge from other industry, not only her and say, do you know, with connected wheelchairs, when you have connected something else, this is the possibility. So Mining equipment or something exactly, else. Exactly, mm -hmm. you know, th that people part. Then you have, this is, you hear, this is about now getting, talking about real life. So having that connection and that platform, which is secure, bit in security, to help her protect those devices so nobody start hacking that way. I think it's, it's uh, two of the one. So help her with knowledge of people, help her protect because she's working with human beings, the nutrition, the healthcare, or, or a couple of things we could help her with. Great. Let's meet another guest. So um, let's meet a 375 year old company that has transformed into Norway's most innovative company in 2019, Postenbring Norway. Uh, last year, they saw the number of deliveries explode as uh, e-commerce skyrocketed during the pandemics. Uh, and we will discuss the impact um, of this new scenario and how they're handling innovation. And to give us insights into this amazing journey, uh, we have with us Senior Vice President of Digital Innovation at Posten and Bring, Alexander Haning. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hanna Bjarte, for a great event so far. So where are you based? What is your home office? My home office is uh, in Oslo. So this is the new normal, I guess. Yes. So I wanted to call this session um, with you from waterfall to hackathons. Tell us briefly um, about your transformation in the last three years. What are some of the milestones that uh, are inspiring? Well, it started a few years ago when it got a new CEO and one of her big focuses was increasing innovation in the whole company. And as part of that, we developed a new project methodology that we implemented called Post and Helix. Uh, what uh, that that's what something I really want to talk about. This is the new way of working. Uh, it has changed a lot. Uh, what what are the components of Post and Helix, and and what is most different compared to before? Just so we get a better understanding. So the Helix model is actually focusing more on the problem and going into the customer needs, and that need might be an internal need for an employee could be a customer or the customer's customer, but actually deep dive into the problem and then start doing prototypes and pilots to see if you have the right solution for that problem. And then you scale. Mm. And when we scale, we do it a bit differently. We start uh, often with a smaller feature set or might be a small geography to learn as we launch a new service or product. And then we scale it up for the whole country or all of the Nordics. 
So it's a lot of design thinking behind it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the, the methodology has been researched by MIT School of Management. Um, and what did they say is unique about your way of working? Well, that's the interesting part, Piotr, because it's not unique. So as you said, it is based on service design, Google Design Sprint, uh, user stories. But the thing uh, that MIT said was special is that a lot of companies talk about these things. But few people succeed at actually implementing this at scale in a big company. So that's what MIT saw, uh, saw was unique. And actually, that's why they've done a research paper and a case study. If you go to my LinkedIn profile and connect with me there, I can actually can send everyone that wants those uh, research papers. And they can read how we actually implement that in real life. That's very generous. Connect with Alexander Horning on LinkedIn. Um, Going back also to the root cause of why, of, of why you've redesigned your way of working, why is, um, why is innovation so crucial to you? Well, we've been around for almost four centuries, but that doesn't mean that we're guaranteed to be here in 40 years. So just like any other company, we need to be on top of everything. We need to be innovating in a fast-moving world and stay relevant to our customers. And as we've heard from uh, Studenso, where their mail, uh, where their um, free business and paper business is going down, so has our mail business gone down. So we need to reinvent ourselves as a company over time. And I think that's not only for us. I think that's uh, you know it's uh, important for all companies to actually focus on innovation, to actually stay relevant and stay alive for the long term. Mm -hmm. So you're also looking for new services, you're looking uh, for new ways to deliver value, tapping into new ecosystems, uh, and you're, transfor you're trying to transform that whole, giving your organization a new mindset in a way to always be innovating. Um, give us some more ingredients in that innovation recipe. You talk about Helix way of working. What else has been really crucial to foster that mindset and to scale innovation? Well, we've seen this across companies and we do a lot of cooperation with other companies. We're part of, uh, we're cooperating with MIT and there's actually three crucial ingredients to succeed with this. And the first is actually top management buy-in. You need to have the CEO, the board of directors actually going for this and really mean it when they say we're going to do innovation in this company. Where else are you going to fail at some point? Mm -hmm. The second thing is actually building a learning organization because it's so easy to sit and know, I know what the customer wants, but we actually need to go out there and talk to the customers every day and really listen mm -hmm. and listen good. I and hear you say is, building a curious yeah. organization. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, definitely. Uh, and have a lot of empathy for the customer, understand what the problems are, and not just think about how can I make me from your problem, but actually listen deep and say, okay, I empathize with you, I see you have these problems, and then you might think of, I have the solution, and then you can make money. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, and this is the really hard part, uh, is a lot of companies do proof of concept. And some people will call it proof of concept hell, because there's proof of concept, proof of concept, and nothing comes out of it. So the really hard part is not actually building a proof of concept or doing a pilot or prototype, it's actually taking that and scaling that to a true business, to a true product, a true service. And that also needs a lot of the right competencies and right mindsets in the executives, but also throughout the organization. Give us some more insights on what, what capabilities do you need to go from small to, to small proof of concept to scaling into a real uh, and deploy it in the ongoing business. What, what have you found is crucial here? Well, the thing is, you need digital capabilities. So, an digital platform. And that's a 400 year old company, and a lot of people listening here also work in old organizations. There's a lot of legacy systems that might hold you back. So, the business side might have a great idea we could do this new product. And then IT says, well, we can't really do that. Give us five years. So it's actually important to build a layer on top if you have a legacy system, a digital platform that can move faster, it can develop faster, and you can continue to learn by getting feedback from users. So you need to have those digital capabilities. And all, everything we talked about so far today about using the cloud, using data, using machine learning is so important into that digital platform to succeed with innovation. So you need to have those capabilities to be able to succeed with innovation. You're the head of the innovation team or the innovation department. What, what role do you and your colleagues play in this innovation equation? 
Well, we have two roles. And the biggest role is to be a catalyst for innovation, to support the whole organization, the business side, but also the administration, with helping them doing projects after the Helix model, and also being a bit of a uh, uh, push them, push the boundaries to get them to think bigger. That's one part. The second part, which is smaller, is to do what we call radical innovation, where we think about far out ideas and test them about prototypes and show there's some business there before we take it back to the business side and scale it up. So you're pushing sort of um, the the awareness of technology opportunities, one can say. Mm. Yes, there's definitely. a question from the audience around how do you change the way um, people interact with um, technology and data and how do you uh, share the vision and um, mm, to really how do you share the vision to and, and create feedback loops so your colleagues um, can actually steer in the right direction that's the question here well it's all about telling stories to be honest with you it's a really basic human need to tell stories uh, and the stories need to be examples small examples so how to do this in practice is that you can't do, you know, are we going to do, do this big, huge launch of this new crazy idea tomorrow? Nobody's going to follow you. But if you do this at a really small scale, with the, you know, a test with a few customers, we, you know, we have this new thing, and it really works. And it has amazing results, and customers really want this. So we explore this further. Then they can start to imagine uh, that there's something there. And also, if you have something... It can be simple as a prototype, paper, digital, just to show the concept, how it actually could be. Because once people can visualize it and be on the same page, it's so much easier to get across. And then in the ongoing business, how much feedback um, do I get if I'm not part of your team? Like, How do you provide feedback on, say, customer interactions, um, loyalty, user experience on an ongoing basis? Well, uh, we do a lot of user uh, dropping, and that's really important, especially in the B2B world, because as a lot of you know, consumer products are often way ahead of the business product. Just imagine the apps you use at home versus the business apps you use. <laughs> you know, it's for a lot. So actually doing user mapping, user story mapping, to actually, how does it feel to be a customer? Does it make sense? Do the people in sales use different words than the people from service and support? Or it's different in the IT system where you're going to do the ordering. So actually mapping that out and getting, again, empathy with the user is very important. Yeah. And you addressed one challenge um, by inviting colleagues to a hackathon, um, which is kind of a rapid exercise with a very clear focus. What was the challenge that you wanted to solve? So we have an app, the Postman app, uh, which is very popular. In Norway, what you do, the most popular way to get your parcel is actually go to a grocery store at the pickup point from Postman. Uh, the problem now, of course, is there are long lines at certain points of the day, and people kind of want to avoid that during the pandemic, naturally. And also, people don't want to stand in line because it takes time. So we did one day hackathon with the app development team, and their problem they wanted to solve is how well, can we do something about this? And they found out, of course, we have data because we know when you pick up your parcel. So we know when there's a peak uh, for people to get the parcel. So could we show that data in the app so you could plan ahead? See, okay, I could come in early in the morning or maybe in the afternoon or something in the evening. There will be less of a line, less of a wait, and also less people. So they made a working prototype in one day. One day, okay. But how long did it take to roll up, roll out the um, solution uh, on a larger scale in, in the post and app? And that goes back to us investing a lot in our uh, digital platform. So we had a digital platform to do rapid development and rapid deployment. So it actually took only one week, one week from that hackathon until this was live for everyone in Norway in the app. I think that's quite amazing. That is, wow, that is really... What's the what's the key to success here? Uh, the key is to actually allow the teams to explore, uh, take set of time to do prototypes, do hackathons. We've done that in in other areas as well. And sometimes you do that with customers. Sometimes you do that with uh, subcontractors. Uh, and actually, the, there's so many great ideas in the organization among the employees, among subcontractors, among customers. And if you just take the time and co-develop those, then magic happens. Finally, 
what what are you able to do today with your new way of working, with your data focus uh, and your customer focus? What are you able to do today that you were not able to do, say, three years ago? Well, it, there's two big changes. The one is the speed to market. From we have an idea until it's in the market, so much faster now than it was three years ago. And the second thing, we, we do a lot more innovation we get a lot more innovation into the marketplace than ever before. Checking. Um, again, how did you reach mo the market with the app that fast? Another question. Maybe you want to just comment. What, like, How many people were involved? Uh, can you do it again? Or was this a once opportunity? Well, we have a, a close-knit team that develops the app from day to day. And of course, they have a backlog of things that we want to implement. And it's really rapid development and rapid deployment as everything's web-based, uh, cloud-based. So we can actually do quite rapid uh, deployments of new versions of the app. So that's back to our digital platform. Mm -hmm. And then it's all about putting in the right things into the app. Thank you so much, Alexander. I think you'll have a lot of um, uh, requests on LinkedIn um, for that. This, that paper and uh, also perhaps to study your um, process uh, a lot closer. It's been really inspirational. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Alexander. <sighs> Can I ask you, um, what do you say, Yuan, if people ask you about Tieto Every? In what way are you becoming an increasingly innovative company? Yeah, we are th first I need to say I'm getting so inspired by these th these uh, speakers. You know, we're talking about companies which has a reputation from the past. Stora Enso has a reputation, so Sodex has a reputation, Post and Bring has a reputation. And it's not about being the most innovative companies. And to be honest, we in Tieto Every have a reputation too. So we can handle the, the old IT. We are great at that one. So in order for us to do exactly what Post and Bring and Alexander is doing, we are transforming ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and actually what we're doing is we have been more doing innovating in the back end, saying that you know, we were sitting in our office, in theater every office, and did innovation with technology. The change we're doing right now is the same thing as Alexander was talking about. Innovations happens with customers. It's actually in that interactions where you hear about the problems, you can understand the technology, that's where innovation really happens. So we are changing our ways of working to be much more closer with our customers. Mm. So, so that is one of the keys. And it's so great to hear these stories. Give us a practical example of what you used to do and how you're doing that differently today. Well, in the past, we went home and we had, we have really skilled technology guys, experts, and they went in and say, what is the best technology I can use? And they built something. They built a new private cloud. And there was great functionality maybe in that one. And I'm a little bit exaggerating to make a point right now. But when you went out to the market, the market said, well, great things, but that's not really what we want. Mm -hmm. And we're not ready to pay for all that functionality because it doesn't bring the value to us. So instead of making those great technology engineers in Tieto Every sitting by themselves, we bring them to the customers. Customer says what the real problem is with their platforms. You heard Alexander, speed is one of them. Okay, how can I get even more speed into it? And then we innovate that one and create that solution. So that's an example. What capabilities are important to develop in order to think think data, think mm -hmm. innovation, mm -hmm. and think security. Um, can you advise us? Well, one of the capabilities, I think, well, to think, I think for, for a business to start being this, who thinks about security data, is actually more people, IT department, we can talk about, the, we can talk about security officer, they need to be more salespeople. Did you hear Alexander talk about storytelling? Mm. I think that is actually one of the capabilities you need to have. Selling the opportunities of technology. You, you mm -hmm. got it. And mm -hmm. then you need to have the competence, of course, about data. You need to have the competence about the possibility of clouds and then the business. But I, but I think one of the things people are missing is the storytelling part. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's a lot about communication then. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Because this is no longer like a CIO, IT or Listen to what uh, Tim was saying, uh, like a CDO problem. This is a business problem. So when you have a company like Storenzo, 24,000 employees, 
how can you actually get 24,000 employees becoming innovative, come up with ideas, see the possibility, and not only maybe 400 people in an IT department or 50 people in an IT department? Mm. So, so all of the, in all of the examples that we've heard, we see that IT and the technology mm. experts are supporting and enabling the mm. business and people. Yeah. Um, how can you develop an even more um, supportive way of working? Well, from us in Theta Every, what we need to do is again coming closer to the customers. And I think this is one, when I actually joined Theta Every, this was one of the reasons. Because we're sitting with a lot of skilled people in the Nordic countries so who can physically, well, now it's the pandemic COVID-19, so not so much physically anymore, but culturally physically work together. And that together with our great expertise in our in EU and in India, it's where we can make it happen. But it's, it's again, it all comes back to, I usually say, we are a people company using, you know, supporting customers with their, with their problems or, or their, their opportunities with support of technology. Mm -hmm. So that's the change we're making. We are a people company. We want to be in the lap of our customers. And that's a big change. I mean, it's a big, big change. Mm -hmm. It's a major change. And we will not drop the technology ball on this one. You know, the, it's still technology. Mm -hmm. and it's doing do, both. Mm -hmm. It's doing both. And like, so that's, that's the point. I see that in so many areas. You need huh? to do both. Yeah. You need to switch perspectives. Yeah. You need to translate. Yes. Um, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the yeah. other yeah. and not protect your area. And you go back and forth and do both. And you heard multi-skilled teams. Exactly. You heard mm -hmm. Alexander talking about, you know, learning. And then people say, learning. Okay. Do I go to do a training course? No. Learning. Listening to the customers. Develop curiosity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's real learning in that there. Thank you, Yuan. Thank you. And continue asking questions. It helps us understand um, if we're relevant here on stage. Um, and it's time to meet another in inspiring leader. Imagine that you're heading a very traditional business uh, with strict regulations. And you have a lot of new te technology that you want to deploy and you want to innovate to stay relevant. Does it sound like an impossible combination? Well, for Finnish earnings-related pension insurance company, it is not. We are meeting now Ilmarinen, yeah. um, also a client of um, Teatro Every. Why yeah. did you select Ilmarinen and, and Mikko um, to highlight uh, some of their ways of working? Yeah. I mean, with, with Ilmarinen, you have a combination of a company which needs to think about compliance and security like everybody else and, and what I'm allowed to do and not. And a lot of companies saying, well, that means that's a hinder for me to go to public cloud. Mm. But look at this company. They've gone full public cloud on their journey, you know, public cloud first mindset, and actually being able to manage those, call it complexity, in a, in a very good way. So, let's see. So, that, that's, well, that's why I really like this story. Help me welcome the head of innovation and strategic development, Mikko Lanto. So when preparing okay. for today, when we had our, our, our preparations discussions, I noticed that there is a red thread in everything uh, that you highlight as success, and that is leadership. Tell us why that is the core of, of innovation and business transformation at Ilmarinen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely you can say that. Uh, we at Ilmarinen want to be the most attractive working life partners, responsible for everyone. That's pretty much the vision of Ilmar and what we want to be. To be able to be attractive, you need to be relevant, right? And you make, make, need to make yourself relevant, I would say. And that needs leadership. So in strategy renewal, actually, a couple of years ago, 2019, when we started the journey, we received our goals to be more customer-centric, customer-efficient, and that, we believe, is achievable by great employee experience. We need to increase understanding of customer needs by enabling the data leadership. This also helps us to focus investment more efficient way and also empower our people to make agile changes for rapidly changing working life. Mm -hmm. So we need to be there when the customer needs us, is practically what I'm saying. And, 
and then leading the things when the when the customer is needing needing something. Mm -hmm. And you've set some challenging goals. You want to be one of Finland's best places to work. You want to offer the best customer experience in your sector. You want to be you create better efficiency. You want to grow profitability, and you want to uh, uh, grow. Uh, faster than the earnings-related pension insurance market in average. That's pretty bold. Um, how are you going to achieve all of this, Mikko? Yeah, bar is in high level and need to be there, I, I suppose. We traditionally are not the company who is usually setting up to high targets or whatsoever, but we wanted to do that. And our renewed strategy is, is pretty much on everyone's table. And I would say that's the key. It's a very relevant, it's a very concrete strategy, and you can use it for daily decision making practically. So roughly two years ago, when we changed the way of working and, and the leading our development work also, and started to lead customer processes in daily businesses practically. So what we did, we actually put the business in the center of our leadership practically and changing the, the IT development direction practically also. So in practice, this means that Ilman's business-oriented development model knows the customer journeys from start to finish. So we want to know, we want to be there with the customer journey practically during the life cycle and the, the lifespan of the customers and the human being. We also include the real customers in the every single development, the continuous improvement mode. This is how we create the efficiency and increase understanding of the customer needs. So being efficient is a very responsible act for the company like us, by the way. So yes, every single euro we can save, as an example, we, from the IT spend or, or whatever, we return to customer through the different payment discounts. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that making the growth in the legislative pension sector where we are is done by making the customer-centric services in an efficient way. And how, how do you ensure that um, you know uh, the customer uh, journey and where each individual customer is on that journey and how do you translate and, and spread those insights to all of your employees? Because this is what creates the employee engagement that they they mm -hmm. feel very, I understand, they feel very close to the customers. Yeah, definitely. So and in real life, really, we actually include every single process development or whatever we want to do, a real customer. So we, we invite them to, Go innovate with us. Go in or innovate with our partners, and that's the key. Then we have, let's say, every practically Ilmarinen's employee, as well as the, all the partners. We, what we are, what we are working with, are practically joining the process development work together with our businesses and together with our technology and, and, and IT department. You may say. So you're really raising who's inside and who's outside, sort of the employee board, and and bringing your partners and and uh, everyone in your ecosystem really, really close. And also bringing the customers very close to your employees. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So, yeah, the cooperation is pretty much the, the core of our values as well, and that's the key. In what way are you in a much better situation than three years ago? No, well, I would say that uh, by taking data into core of our leadership has changed a lot. So we really now actually understand more where we are and what needs to be fixed. What's, what's the delta of our future, you might might say. As an example, we have thoroughly analyzed our IT spend and created the methods of leading the cost more detailed level, understanding more proactively also what is the euro we're going to need and what we're going to spend, what we're going to get practically. So very simple, I would say. So additionally, I think that now we are in the better continuously improve our way of working to ensure sustainable cost and uh, cost uh, efficiency development. So, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a daily action what we do. Mm -hmm. We also make a very detailed business cases, all the calculations in the priority any investment is practically made, and that's really the, the key I would say. So we want to understand really in the proactive way and before making any investment really that what's the Euro level we're going to spend, and what is the value for our customers? What are we going to get? By this, we understand better where we investments should make, and what is the value asset? What we're going to get? This helps us really to decrease the cumulative business process development amount. But simultaneously, we we've been able to actually add more value for our customers. Mm 
So you can say simply that we are actually spending less money, but getting more values are more rapidly out from our development cycle. Can you give us some insights to how you develop your ways of working? Because you're saying things like, so we created new methods for this and we changed the way we do this. Can you talk about your sort of your, the development of these ways of working and what has been guiding you and give some advice to everyone who might feel that, yes, we want to go this way? What has been crucial in order to change the way you work? Yeah. No, I, I think that we actually, when we started the strategy renewal phase, we, what we did actually, we took our our values in the core of our leaders, really. And we opened it, it's at the openness and, and cooperation also, with, together with our business customers and, and, and with our partners. And that changed a lot, I would say. So so we simply actually started to, to be very open for our strategic partners, like Tieto Every as an example. What we did, uh, actually, we very openly openly actually started to share the data, understand more thoroughly the data, and together trying to understand values for the both sides, practically, and then jointly creating the value for the customer, practically. So I would say that that's, it's a very, very big change for us. And then simultaneously, the direction, what we actually did, that, that, the, that the business really started to lead our daily development. We didn't actually talk about any more the IT development it's a, really the business transformation, actually, what we do and the focus to do. So we wanted to also to change the way of acting also in that way. So so business is really doing that also in the concrete way. So we have a process owners, the roles, who are actually reporting directly to the business leaders. In, and, and then they are actually owning the whole, whole change, what we are actually investing to. And you moved over 70% of your workload into public cloud to achieve these goals and to speed things up to achieve efficiency. Uh, what would you say is the biggest gain so far that you did not anticipate beforehand? Yeah, first of all, I need to say that the first, uh, it was probably the fastest cloud transition in the world. And big thanks for Tieto Evre leading the project and making this everything possible. It was a huge step forward, I would say. That's great. So, so yeah, we've been able to fulfill pretty much everything what we actually started to wanting to change with the with the first step into the into the cloud. I would say so. We have re received the the all the business goals, fully business case uh, has been fulfilled, and we have also simplified our architectural uh, let's say steps and and the direction also. Uh, but but also. Nowadays, we are much more closer to, let's say, to the, to the moment when we can actually start to change the, the, the business, business, let's say, direction so more rapidly and really starting to respond to the need of the rapidly changing working life. But that's, of course, still the future, I would say. So when we started to, like I of the infrastructure uh, services first and then, then now starting to gaining the, the power of the cloud and the transformation phase afterwards. There's a question from our audience if you received a lot of resistance uh, when you suggested uh, moving uh, to the public cloud. Um, and yeah, how you handle really, that? Say, yeah, not really. I would say so. I would say that the openness and the eyes open for everything. That's the, really the big change, what we actually did. And, and when we started the cloud journey roughly two years ago and started the first planning, it, uh, and yeah, everyone, of course, was a bit the doubtful first and, and was kind of, okay, in the regulated business like we are, we, you cannot really use the public cloud. It was the starting point pretty much. But, mm -hmm. but then we actually, what we did was that, uh, that, uh, that, hey, let's start to figure it out. That can we even discuss it? So we started from the low hanging fruits type of the direction and, and started to discuss it very openly. That what about if we can move something to the cloud? What about then if, if, if we move something and we move something more pretty much? But very, very early phase, we actually included pretty much everyone into the discussions. So we included the, the leadership, the management team, board of directors of Ilmarinen. We include regulator also in our, our talks and, and the discussions. We include a lot of different partners to our discussions and a lot of our customers into our discussions. And we started to very openly to plan and understand that what's the benefit of cloud? What's the, let's say, the security rules and the act we need to take care of. It's a security first for everything what we do at Ilmarinen. There's no question about that we can do any 
any let's say uh, let's say mistakes in there, that area and so on and so. But you I would are... say that the openness was the key. Johannes is nodding here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think you like this recipe. Yeah. Uh, in what way is this an unusual way of working? Or do you see this happening more and more that you, uh, you would, work with, with creating engagement? And No, but I think it, it is a couple of things which Mika was talking about, which is getting more normal, but it's not everybody doing it. It's, it's first thinking about the whole business case and understanding this, the value for, for the business, involving the business. But you heard, I mean, I love it when you say regulators too, you know, don't, don't think that you're going to fix it by yourself. There are experts around you, regulation experts, technology experts, customers which are experts, what they want, you bring them in. And then I'm going to take one with me from, from because I say, you know, public first strategy is not against security first strategy. Mm. It actually can go hand in hand. And, and if, you, if you do that and have that mindset and then you start taking small pieces, you actually can do exactly what Inmarina has done. So you do handle a lot of sensitive data. What it, uh, is your advice on how to, how to move forward in a, an, in a safe and scalable way? Yeah. I would say that yeah, security first for everything and the eyes open, like I said, that's the, that's the key when we when we start to talk, talk about the sensitive data. By this, I mean that we when we start to, to journey and when we make the cloud transformation type of things or whatsoever, you really need to be open to and, and, and give the possibility to security level discussion, I would say. So when we selected the Google Cloud from the crowd as an example, uh, the primary selection criteria was simply that we need to be able to ensure that the data location is in Finland. There's no question about that. So that, that was the criteria number one, I would say. Also, the high level of the data security and the protection was the, the highly, highly essential criteria as all of in the, in the inside of technology, I would say. But then additional, the, the Tieto Everest ability to provide strong local expertise, obviously, and the, it, let's say the possibility is to also to develop those talents and increase those talents and scale up when we we scale up also where the ski keys as as well to when we when we started the journey. Mm -hmm. Since the start of the journey, we also started the frequent follower as an example. That, that's really the key as well. That that uh, it's not really that that uh, we we are building here something internally in Inmarin, but like I said, the open discussion helps us to understand more thoroughly every party that what's the really the data protection and, and the security level in the, in the different field and different areas we need to follow. Mm. I hear you say that you develop sort of a security-oriented mindset. What else can we add here in terms of how to handle com compliance and security in relation mm. to public cloud? Well, I, th I think it is, when you think about it as security first or built-in security, that you don't take it as a bolted on afterwards. When you go on your public cloud journey, you build in security. And there's so many possibilities in public cloud to actually increase your security. And sometimes I talk about, you know, how many security experts do I have in tier to every versus Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure, you know. They have thousands and thousands of people only thinking about security for their clouds. So being able, if you have a mindset, to do that. And then we as technology players need to be able to translate this. You know, it's again, we need to be the experts because that's what companies like Inmarine needs. They don't need a, a huge amount of people. They really need really, really good people who can actually help them and support them in their decisions. Mika, there's another question for you. How did you agree and communicate with regulatory authorities um, about the public cloud? Were there any such um, harsh discussions? Well, I wouldn't actually describe those as a hard discussions, really. We, there were, was a learning curve for everyone, I would say. That we started very openly discussed at our plans and, uh, let's say, very accurately compared them, those immediately to certain legislation, certain regulations, what we face in the EU area and, uh, and, uh, and the EU level as an example. But, but very openly and not questioning anything. But, but we've actually questioned simultaneously everything you might say that we actually uh, we didn't take the advices as an opposite, say, let's say, debate for us, but more kind of openly started to investigate what they guided us well. And we learned 
And I suppose that there has been some learnings also for the regulator that, and also when we started mm. our project, we simultaneously include them, and we we all the time mm. frequently actually update also the regulator where we are with the project, what is happening, if we are facing any difficulties, what are those, if we are understanding, have facing some technical difficulties, how we are facing those and solving those, what is the issues in the partner level, what is issues in the talent management level, and so on and so forth. A pretty open discussion, yeah. Thank you, Miko, for sharing so openly and for showing us that it's both about leadership, minds, mindset, communication, and then understanding opportunities with technology. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miko. You want, you. Um, we are wrapping up, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I love summarizing and helping our audience summarize. So yeah. can we just summarize again? Uh, mm -hmm. What is the route? to uh, data and innovation? Well, again, that was the three. Remember to the insight and innovation, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, again, is the value of data. So make sure that you connect the data from the different sources. Don't build this. Go away from, call it multi-silos, into a multi-cloud part. Number two. Yes, it's a complex environment, especially if your company is the one we heard, who had a lot of legacy with them. But make sure you make this platform where you can actually build applications and solutions on top. These platforms need to be scalable. And sometimes you can translate that as to speed also, because scale up and down with speed. You need to have built-in security, so you have a security mindset first. And it needs to be a stable platform, because your company is now Dependent on that, it works. And not only on the company, your customers on that. And finally, it's the people, the talent. You need to connect the data with the people. And the people are a combination of your business people, you heard in Marin, your customers, your partners, and also sometimes your partners' partners, the ecosystems, to actually facilitate that kind of uh, work. Those and hyperconnect all of them. And mm -hmm. hyperconnect them to the data, which will give you the insight innovation. And those companies being able to get those three together, that I mean, the opportunities are endless. And they will be the strong plays in the market. And you can see from these examples today that you can transform. Mm -hmm. Can you help us look forward? Mm -hmm. uh, ending by looking forward. Um, Three things that you mm. think will be even more important uh, in 2021 mm. that yeah. we should really, really look at, look for yeah. and learn more about. Yeah. So I'm a little bit colored here, ex-CIO of Ericsson. No, but the whole 5G edge and the connected devices. We need to understand as technology players, as businesses, uh, our customers, what are the opportunities? We just scratched the surface of this one. So that one I'm personally going to learn more about and understanding how I can help my, my customers and our customers. Number two, we talked about security. You know, we need to sell, we need to learn more and we need to be able to sell to all our colleagues and friends that security, you heard security first. We need to understand that because that leads into number three. The and data. what is required to foster a security or exactly. and when oriented you do, And when you do that, you need to learn more about the data you have. Because mm -hmm. certain data are your golden nuggets, which makes you unique. And certain data is just general data. So, so I think, again, 5G edge connected devices, security, and then understand more, even more, the possibility of this data, these golden nuggets you are having. And if I'm watching now and I'm yeah. feeling... I need some support here. Yeah. I'm now also responsible yeah. for developing this yeah. competence, um, creating this support, yeah. enabling all yeah. of this. How can you help? But this is our job. This is why we exist. We want to help our customers to, to win. We get Our team gets most proud, not when Tieta ever win, but actually when our customers are in the paper, when we hear these stories. So our job is to have people, experts, in the laps of our customers. So they actually get this support and get this expertise. And then of course, me being responsible for cloud and infra, this, this platform, making sure that, that one is a stable built-in security and a scalable one. That's what we need to do. That's what we're gonna make you know, the whole Nordic more successful and that's what we all want to help. You know. 
Thank you, everyone, for being with us today, for listening in, for tuning in to this live stream. Uh, we hope you feel inspired and well equipped to speed up innovation um, to insights, to speed up your route to insights and innovation. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. At Theatre Every, we create digital advantage for businesses and societies. What does it mean? We can be fast, faster than we ever thought, and strong beyond our wildest dreams. With great ideas, we can change the world, no matter where we are or where we come from. We can be agile, even if we're big. We can give peace of mind to those who need it the most and a voice to those who didn't have one before. Technology won't solve all your problems, but it can help you reach whatever you wish to achieve. Brighter future, together.